sacrifice on the cross, God. Because of you, we have life. You are the overcomer, and you have overcame the power of death. You are worthy of all our praise, God. So today, as we are here, please let us open our hearts and sing our praises to you, God. Let us be able to sing our praises because we are so thankful for what you have done for us. God, please help us be able to know who you are more today. Um, through the songs and through the, through the message today, God, please help us be able to know who you are more. And God, please help us be able to have this thankful heart today as we are here. Thank you for everything you've done in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I encourage you to rise if you can and let us sing um, the worship song together. I'm 
Peter chapter 2, verse 24 and 25 says, uh, 23 and 24 says, When they hurled their insults at them, at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. So today, Jesus, I just want to thank you because you are worthy of all honor and all praise. And because of your suffering, we are freed from our sins. And because you bore your life and our sin on the cross, we can die to sin and live for righteousness. And because of your wounds that we are healed, Jesus, you are the healer and the rescuer. Because of you, all of us here could be born again. And because of you, we have steadfast hope and we can live forever free. And so Jesus, today I just want to thank you for the gift of salvation. And thank you for your sacrifice. God, today may we, um, as we sing the next song, we can all reflect on your greatness and your love for us. And God, um, I just want to say thank you for everything that you have done for us. We are unworthy, but you are the worthy one, God. So thank you. Let us sing the next song together.
worthy, and you are the lamb that died for our sins, God. And I pray for this service today. God, please be with us as we move forward. And today, um, let us be able to learn more about you through your word. Um, I pray for Pastor David as he comes up later. Um, yeah, and just in my prayer, amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, how wonderful to have you here and to be able to worship together. Uh, before we start, let's give the praise team a big hand. Uh, what an amazing time of worship. Thank you so much for leading us uh, today. You know, they were a little concerned because they haven't done this in a year. And they were a little worried that they were going to be rusty, but I think they did a pretty good job. So thank you for uh, leading us into a great time of worship. Um, Today we have a lot going on. We have baptism afterwards, so it's going to be a short message, but hopefully short and sweet. Um, we, uh, we wanted to, uh, also we have a guest today joining us, perhaps for the first time uh, coming to church. We uh, thank you for taking the courage to come, and we hope that you are blessed today and that you take something with you from your experience at church today. Today I wanted just to talk a little bit about, um, one sec. I wanted to talk a little bit about how to find ultimate blessing. You know, if you think about it, every human being is looking for blessing. Everyone is looking for that one thing that will fulfill your life forever. Everybody is looking for that one thing that will change your life forever. Everybody is looking for that one thing that will satisfy you for the rest of your life. We're all after the ultimate blessing. That's what every human being is after. We want ultimate fulfillment, ultimate happiness. We want to find the ultimate blessing in life. And today, I want to share with you how you can actually do that. Today, the scriptures, they give us uh, the answer to where ultimate blessing in life is found. So you can finally find the one thing in your life that you're looking for, so you can finally be satisfied, so you can finally be fulfilled. Uh, if you have your Bibles, please open with me. If you don't have your Bibles, please uh, look uh, with somebody next to you. If this is your first time at church, don't worry about it. I'll read it for you. But if you do have a Bible, please open to Genesis chapter uh, 28, verses 10 to 22. Genesis chapter 28, verses 10 through 22. Let me read to you from Scripture, from the Word of God, in Genesis chapter 28, verses 10 through 22. And this is what it says. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran, and he came to a certain place and stayed there that night, because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head, and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. 
Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So early in the morning Jacob took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on top of, on top of it. He called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of the city was Luz at the first. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set up a pillar for shall be God's house. And, for, and of all that you give me, I will give you a full tenth to you. Jacob was a pretty messy character in the Bible. Today, we find him as a fugitive running away from his house because he tried to deceive his older brother and his dad so he can receive the blessings of the firstborn. Basically, he was trying to lie to his dad and his older brother to steal the family inheritance, to become number one, to beat his older brother, to come out on top, in order to do that, he, he had to deceive and lie to his dad and his brother uh, because that's what he wanted. He wanted power, he wanted riches, he wanted to be on top, he wanted to be number one. But his plans massively backfired and instead of getting the inheritance and everything that he wanted, he is running for his life. His older brother found out what he was going to do and he was waiting for the day to kill his younger brother Jacob as soon as his dad passed away. So uh, Jacob's mom found out that Esau, his older brother, wanted to kill him and immediately she sends him to Haran, to the land where his brother was living. It was about 500 miles away. However, this was a risky move. She wanted to send him there for his safety so that his older brother doesn't kill the younger brother, but also so that Jacob can find a wife from within the same faith from within the same uh, family of, of, uh, of uh, Jacob's mother that believed in the same God. So she's trying to send him to Haran, to her brother Laban. Uh, but this was risky because it was 500 miles away. It was a very dangerous path there. And they hadn't talked to each other for the past 60 years. So she didn't even know whether her family, brother's family, were still alive. She didn't know if they're still there, but she just wanted to save her younger son's life, so she sends him away. Jacob, who was more of a homebody, uh, Esau was the one that liked hunting and doing all of these crazy things. Jacob liked, liked staying at home. He was more like a daughter. That's why his mother favored uh, uh, Jacob more than Esau. But nonetheless, uh, you know, she, he, he goes out to a path where he doesn't know where he's going to end up a dangerous path and he starts going all by himself without really knowing what's going to be ahead of him. He might not actually find his uncle, he might not actually find a job, he might not actually find a career, he might actually never marry. If, if, everything is, if his uncle is not there, he is in big trouble. But there's more trouble at home because his older brother wants to kill him so he's forced to flee and become a fugitive. Uh, on his road to his uncle's place, uh, Jacob, you know, he is, is a, back then people didn't have cars. He basically had to walk there 500 miles. It was a long road ahead of him. So he takes a nap. And it's, it is at this moment, in the lowest point of his life, in the moment of most suffering and hardship and uncertainty, that he has the greatest encounter of his life. When he just you know, lays down to sleep just for a little bit before he continues his journey, it is then that he has a dream. He has a dream and he encounters, he, in, in the lowest point of his life, he has the greatest encounter of his life through a dream. He meets God through a dream. Here it says that when he was dreaming, he saw a portal to heaven. 
He, said, he says that he saw heaven and earth, angels ascending and descending from heaven to earth, and there was a staircase. There's a lot of meaning, biblical meaning behind this dream. At the very least, this means that heaven and earth is real. Both places are real. Heaven is real. Earth is real. And angels do come and go between both realms of heaven and earth in obedience to God. If God sends an angel to give a message, they come from heaven to earth in obedience to God. At the very least, we can see that there's two realms. There's earth. There's heaven. There are angels that go back and forth. And the staircase is a symbol of Jesus Christ. If you look at John chapter 1, verses 45 through 48, Jesus himself says that he's a staircase. Here it's showing us, even though it's a dream, salvation is still by faith, is still in Jesus Christ. The stair staircase is showing us that only Jesus is the one who gives us access to heaven. Only Jesus is the one who gives us access to God, access to heaven. He takes us from being earthly to a totally new level of experiencing eternity. So all of this is, 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 is part of this dream. And, and Jacob is, is, is encountering God through this dream. In the most difficult time of his life, he's having the most powerful encounter uh, that he's ever had. He came to know God through Christ. You know, sometimes people say, people that don't go to church and that don't believe in God, sometimes people say, isn't it unfair for people that have never heard about Jesus and where people cannot even go to tell them about Jesus, to die and go to hell when they didn't even have a chance for anybody to go there and share the gospel with them? is a valid question. Sometimes people ask that question is a valid question, but that's, we ask that question because we only think of it in terms of, you know, what we can think of, our own limits. To God, you know, God can actually use dreams to bring people to the faith. Just like we're seeing with Jacob, people can actually meet God through dreams. It's a weak argument, I understand, but God is not limited to people. And, and of course, people is a primary way where missionaries go and share the gospel and this is how it should be done. But God is not limited to that. We just don't understand the ways that God can work. And God can even have a donkey actually speak human language so that humans can understand. We are limited. God is not limited. God is saving Jacob, encountering Jacob today through a dream. A few years back, when you listen to Christian radio stations, some of them would actually, for many weeks, they, they would share stories of the Middle East of many, many Muslims who were all having the same dream. All Muslims were having the same dream. They were dreaming of this guy with a white robe that appeared in their dreams and told them, I am Jesus. <laughs> and that's how many Muslims converted to Christianity. So, you know, th this is how Jacob is, is coming to the most important encounter of his life and the most difficult time of his life. And, and, and the best part of this is that God came, by the way, every other religion, they say, their God says, you come to me, I am God, you serve me, and you come up to me. But the Christian God says, I will come down to you. I will come and meet you. I will come. Christianity is the only religion that claims God came for us. Not that God said, you come up because I'm God. No, but he actually came down all the way to becoming a human being. 100% God, 100% human being. But here, God, the most, possibly the most surprising thing about this passage is that God didn't come to a perfect human being. God didn't come to a successful human being. God came to the most messy human being. A liar, a deceiver, a betrayer of his dad, family. He made a mess of his life. And God comes down and throws a heavenly party for Jacob with angels and everything. This is showing us who the Christian God is. The Christian God is a God that pursues not perfect people, but sinners. He's in love with sinners. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've done. He is after you. 
He is pursuing you and He will come after you with a passion, with a heavenly party. He throw, he'll throw a heavenly party for the worst of sinners. <laughs> That's what we're seeing here happening with Jacob. You know, angels and everything. He gets to see a portal to heaven and he gets to, you know, meet God in his dream. He doesn't deserve this. But this is who the Christian God encounters. Sinners. Those who don't deserve God. And so Jacob is, you know, he wakes up and then he realizes uh, that, you know, something uh, radical happened to him. He realizes he doesn't understand everything yet, just like you won't if you come to the faith in the beginning. You have a lot of questions. He doesn't understand everything yet. But he says, I have met God in this place. This is, this is a holy place. This is the gate of heaven. This is a holy house of God. This is a holy place because I encounter the presence of God here. His life is forever changed. The place is changed and his life is forever changed the moment he encountered God. In his dream, God promised him land. Everything that he promised Abraham and Isaac, now he promises to Jacob. God promises to give him land. God promises to give him offspring. God promises to give him protection, sec security, future security. God said, I will bring, many, many years later, I will bring you back to this place. I will bring you back to your dad's house. God is promising future security. God is promising land. God is promising to use Jake. He's saying from, from Jacob, an offspring will come that will bless the whole earth. God is giving Jacob purpose and meaning, a spiritual calling. All the things that we're looking for as human beings, a calling, a purpose, a meaning, land, you know, to have a piece of land where you can find identity and stability, uh, to, to, you know, to have a purpose and a calling, to have protection, security. All of us are after security. We want to feel secure. That's what all of us as human beings are after. And God says, you will find all of those things in me. In other words, God is saying to Jacob, everything you are looking for in life, it's me. Everything you're after, everything you're trying to get blessings from, every, every single spot where you're trying to find blessing from, you're not going to find it. You're always going to be disappointed. Do you know why? Because whether you know it or not, you're looking for me. And you will only find what you're really looking for. You will only find ultimate blessing when you find me. That's what, you know, Jacob is, is starting to understand. That all of his life, all of his life, he was after blessing his entire life. The most insecure character in the scriptures, perhaps. He was after blessing his entire life. He was after fulfillment, after satisfaction. He tried to find blessing first by pleasing his dad. Because remember, his dad favored the older brother because he was more manly. He, he favored Esau. So uh, Jacob always grew up being you know, the second favorite. He always wanted the love of the dad. He, he always wanted to be to prove himself to be accepted by his dad. Perhaps that's what led him to lie and deceive and want to be number one, want to come out on top because he wanted to hear from his dad that his dad is pleased with him, that, that his dad loves him. He, he, was, he, was, he was so, uh, he wanted to find blessing in, in, in the acceptance and the approval of his father. Later on in life, he also wanted to find acceptance and approval in romance. Remember how he pursued Rachel for seven years? He was obsessed. He thought, okay, blessing is found, is going to be found in my father's approval. Okay, it's not there. Okay, blessing is going to be found in romance. When I find Rachel and I, I marry her, everything is going to be okay in life. It didn't happen. Every place he looked for blessing. And after he got those things, in the end, they all disappointed they all disappointed. It was not what he thought it would be. It was not what the culture around them and the world around them told them it should be. When he finally achieved those things, 
it wasn't as good as he thought. It was actually quite disappointing. It didn't fulfill him. It didn't satisfy him. It wasn't the ultimate blessing he was looking for. Because he will only find ultimate blessing in Christ. Everything he was looking for, he will only find when he encounters God by putting his faith in Christ. And we know this is the case because at the end of Jacob's life, remember what Jacob does? At the end of Jacob's life, he wrestles with God. Remember, he wrestles with God. But even though he should have let go of God because it was dangerous for him as a man to try to wrestle God, and eventually he does get crippled. You know, God does touch, you know, his socket, and then he, he injures him, he cripples him for the rest of his life. But even then, Jacob would not let go. Remember when he wrestles with God, and even after he's crippled, Jacob doesn't let go of God. He says, bless me. He said, I'm not going to let go of you. He's saying, I try to find blessing with my dad. I try to find acceptance for my dad. I try to find blessing with Rachel in romance. I try to find blessing in riches and power and becoming top number one. I never found blessing there. I finally found it in you, and I'm not letting go. I finally found what I'm looking for, my ultimate blessing. It's you. I finally get it. And you can cripple me for the rest of my life. You can kill me if you want, but I'm not letting go. Because I finally found what I was looking for. I finally found ultimate blessing in this life, in you. So I am not letting go. Um, and that's, you know, what, what we see from our passage today. This blessing, however, is not just for Jacob. This blessing is available for all of us. You know, God said to Jacob that he was going to use Jacob to bless the whole earth, the families of the whole earth, through his offspring. That offspring is Jesus Christ. Jesus came from the line of Jacob, ultimately to bless all mankind. Meaning, it's not just Jacob who can find ultimate blessing by finding Christ. Everybody, everybody can find ultimate blessing in this life through Christ. So I wanted to invite you today, if this is the first time perhaps that you are coming to church, or if you've been coming to church for the longest time, yet if you are still looking for blessings in all the wrong places, today I invite you to finally find rest, to finally find the blessing that you are looking for, to finally find ultimate blessing by finding Jesus Christ. I invite you to give your life to Jesus. Like Justine was saying, Jesus gave his life for you. He died on the cross so that you can come to know him, so that you can have Jesus, so you can spend eternity with Jesus. He gave his life for you. This is the opportunity you have today. You know, Jacob, when he slept and, and woke up, he said, this is the house of God. He was basically saying, this is church. The place where heaven and earth meets, where heaven and earth collide, where you meet God, this is church. <laughs> you are a church today. <laughs> this is your Bethel. This is your church. The blessing that was available to Jacob is available to you today. You can also encounter Christ and have your life forever changed, forever transformed. You can find ultimate blessing. You don't have to waste another day looking for blessings where you will never find them. You will only find what you're looking for when you find Christ. We invite you to our relationship with Him. All you have to do is simply start. This is just to start. There's a lot more you're going to have to talk with God after this. But just to start, if you would like to have a relationship with God today, just for starters, all you have to do is pray. Just a simple prayer. Just say, Jesus, I give you my life and let him take over. Let him start his journey with you from this day forward. 
Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today, Lord, and help us to be reminded once again, like Jacob, you are the ultimate blessing that, we, that we're looking for. Help us to hold on to you so tightly and never let go, understanding that everything that we're looking for is found only in you. Anybody that's new here visiting perhaps that doesn't know you yet, we ask for the same blessings that you poured upon Jacob's life. We ask that you encounter them in such a powerful way that they too can find ultimate blessing by putting their trust in you, by putting their faith in you, by giving their life to you, Jesus. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen. We have three brothers, young brothers, getting baptized. Uh, it's a great day because for us, at least as a church, it's a day where God is showing us that He's still at work in our midst, that He's still rescuing people out of darkness into the light. So it's a very beautiful day, a joyful day, a day of celebration. Let me give you a little bit of background on baptism, and then after that I'm going to invite everybody getting baptized to come up, and they're going to share a little testimony with you. And then we're going to baptize them, we're going to pray for them, and after the service, you can take pictures, give your gifts to them, and congratulate them for their baptism. Baptism is a command by our Lord Jesus Christ that those who have repented and put their faith in Jesus express their union with Christ in His death and resurrection through baptism. Baptism is a command from the Lord that He gave us to keep continuously as a church until He comes back. Like John Piper says, when we trust in Christ, His death counts as our death, His resurrection counts as our resurrection. We symbolize this through baptism. In baptism, we dramatically portrayed what happened to us spiritually when we received Christ. Our old self of unbelief and rebellion and idolatry died, and our new identity, a person of faith and submission and treasure in Christ came into being, all of that through faith. That's what we confess and that's what we symbolize when we go down into the water as though we were being buried with Christ and come back out. Through baptism, we show that we are buried with Christ in the likeness of His death, raised to walk in newness of life. There is a holy appeal to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit to be present in this act and make the portrayal true and real in what it says about the work of redemption. There is no salvation without the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, one God, in three persons. When we call upon their name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we are depending upon them, all of them, and we are honoring them, and we're saying that this act of baptism is by them and for them. Baptism was a sacred expression of faith, a faith that unites you to Christ and His people. Baptism is an expression of saving faith, and therefore, only for believers. That's what baptism is. It is a demonstration of the burial and the resurrection with Jesus, which happened through faith. So only those who have put their faith in Christ should get baptized. Baptism is very important. It was uncompromisingly commanded and ordained by the Lord Jesus Christ until He comes. It was universally practiced and administered by Christians in the early church and has been all throughout the centuries. It was closely connected to being a member of a local church. In the mind of the apostles, to be united to Christ by faith through baptism was to be united to the body of Christ, and local churches are the manifestation of the universal body of Christ. To be a Christian, therefore, is to belong to a local church. John Tyson says, In the New Testament and throughout church history, we see baptism not just as a symbol, but it's a sign that marks your life. 
It's a place that you can fight from spiritually. It's a declaration. You are joining in a sacred practice the followers of Jesus have done in every time and in every place where they are declaring loyalty to Jesus. And in spiritual warfare, when you feel attacked, you can say, it is I baptized in Christ, raised with Him in His righteousness. So this is a powerful day. A day filled with honor and joy and celebration for those who are here today. We don't need baptism to be saved, but through baptism we do show the world publicly that now we are committed to Christ for the rest of our lives. Baptism is an outward symbol of the internal transformation that has taken place in our lives. That's the commitment that Jojo, Joshua, and Julia have made privately and today want to share publicly with you today through baptism. That they acknowledge that, that, that apart from Christ, they are dead in their sins, enslaved to their sins, and destined to an eternity apart from Him that Jesus has washed them through his blood and given them new life, that they will give the rest of their lives to trust in him, to follow him, and to live for him and for him alone. The more correct way of baptism is through immersion. And this is how, you know, we wanted to do it. And this is how everybody uh, that's getting baptized today wanted to, they wanted to be dunked into a pool. However, <laughs> We don't have a pool here right now. We even thought about bringing an inflatable pool and doing something like that, but we couldn't. Uh, immersion through Baptism through immersion was how baptism was also practiced in the early church. However, sprinkling was also acceptable. And it did come a little later, and it usually happened when there wasn't enough water or a place to actually dunk someone. Then you will resort to the option of sprinkling someone and baptizing them. Due to COVID and to our current circumstances, we cannot dunk people today, so we will sprinkle them and baptize them. Now, we're gonna invite uh, those that are getting baptized, I'm gonna invite you guys to please come and stand right next to me and uh, share your testimony with us, Jojo, Joshua, and Julio. And you're gonna hear from them. Uh, you guys can stand right here. This is a very nerve-wracking moment for them. Look at how young they are. <laughs> so let's give them a hand, you know, just so, so they can, uh, you know, loosen up a little. All right, we're going to have Jojo come up. Come up here, Jojo. And you can take off your mask. And yeah, and you can share with us. Go ahead. You can stand right here. by the Nordstroms. I'd gone to church with my sister and sometimes really enjoyed it, and sometimes I could really care less of what the pastor had to say. I also went to an water program where you would learn about the Bible and get rewards for it. I also attended Bible studies and also Christian events in the summer. One of them, of which I really met Christ and truly believed everything about how to become a Christian. It was around four years ago in which I had confessed my life to God. I was at a summer VBS camp for kids. I was really enjoying the things I had learned and studied during these three days I was there. It was one on the last day on which I really reflected my life and gave my life to Christ. After giving my life to Christ, I always knew that, I, that my life has been an on, on and off towards Christ, and I always knew that I needed to be saved once again. That's when on February 16, 2021, I really told myself that I needed to get saved once again. I was about to go and sleep, uh, go to sleep on that very night until I reflected on my life and realized that my relationship with Christ was not strong enough. I realized that I would always get bored of sermons, sometimes even demotivated to go to church with my sister. On that very night, I prayed and prayed about how Christ can save me once again, considering the fact that I didn't treat confessing my life to God seriously the first time. I prayed to God to make me have a stronger relationship with Christ. A couple of days after confessing my life once again, I really want to show everyone that I had been part of Christ's family. 
This is why I chose it to get baptized to show everyone that I finally realized that I've become part of the family of God and that I was going to live eternally in heaven with all my brothers and sisters of Christ. Thank you for everyone who supported me on this journey from the very start of my Christian faith. Great job. Thank you. Go ahead. You can stand there. Thank you. All right. We'll have Joshua now. Come. The way I got into the church is probably because of my parents. Because from the day I was born, I remember once a week I would go to church. I'm not going to lie in fourth grade. I dozed off sometimes and wasn't the best at answering questions about the sermon. My teacher saw this and wanted me to focus on sermons, so he decided to make a work worksheet. And there was one question, and it said, "Explain the sermon." I didn't know how to answer this question because I wasn't focused, and I saw others that were also worried about because they didn't listen. Also, in the end, me and my four me and four other students got the answer wrong, and it was embarrassing. So from then on, I decided that I should focus more. From then on. I learned a lot about what Jesus did for us, and I wanted to learn more. So I think that I think I became a Christian because of my parents and also the teachers that helped me focus more on the sermons. I think I decided to get baptized because on one time we watched some um, of the high schoolers get baptized, and I just said to myself, I wanted to get baptized too. I remember my teachers told me a couple of weeks before that baptism is technically surrendering their life to faith, and I also wanted to surrender my my life to faith. So that is why I decided to get baptized today. Thank you. Oh yeah. Thank you. All right, Julio. So, I think the Nordstrom's actually invited me and my family to go here, GBC. And I've honestly been like, I was born and raised into like a religious household. I mean, I've been religious my whole life. That's just what we did. And I was just following what my parents did. I mean, I was born and raised a Catholic, and that's what I've been doing for a lot. And then we converted to this church right here. I didn't pay attention or anything. I wasn't even a Christian. I was just calling myself a Christian. In other words, I was playing the hypocrite. You know, I would call myself a Christian and then I would go lie, I would steal, I'd blaspheme, I would use God's name in vain. I'd use a bad language. I mean, that's just how I played it. Man. So then, I think a little while ago, I had an old friend of mine and we'd go to this church every Tuesday and it was really great. I mean, they had good sermons. It was just amazing. And I wasn't really taking it seriously though, but there was this one sermon where they had us close our eyes. And they said, if anyone here wants to give their lives to God right now, I want you to raise your hand. So I didn't want to be the kid that didn't raise his hand. So I raised my hand, not knowing what I was doing. But they were so nice to me. They met me after the sermon and they gave me this Bible. And it was so cool because I mean, like I never really had a Bible of my own. And if I did, I probably lost it. Um, <laughs> but this Bible, I was so hyped about it. And then I would put it on my nightstand. But I never touched it at all. I didn't read it, not once. And then there was just this one night, this one night, it just hit me. Like, it just hit me. Man, I was taking God seriously, not one time. And it just hit me. I mean, I, it's like this type of thing where you confess your sins to God, and it just like, it, everything is just changing. Everything is just different. Because what a lot of people do is they don't, like, confess their sins. They're too prideful about it, and they think they have everything figured out, but they don't. So on that very night, I gave my life to the Lord. And the next morning, the first thing I did was pick up that very Bible and I read it, Book of John. Had no idea what I was reading, but I was reading it anyways. And I would read this book for an hour every single day. And, and that first morning when I was reading that Bible, I was sitting on the couch and uh, my mom comes in, she sees me reading my Bible and she's like, what are you doing? You never read that. And uh, I was just like, I don't know, I felt like it. And then later on, she comes back in and she's crying and she tells me, we have to move again. I had no idea what to say except go tell God about it. Go, go to God with it. Because that's what I did and that's what solved my problems. 
And then, and then I just kept growing with God more and more and more. And, and then four months later, I come to find out that God is calling me to be a pastor. I mean, are you kidding me? I, I, I just became a Christian. And then four months later, he calls me to be a pastor. I mean, God's got to be insane to do that because he's calling a kid with ADHD to be a pastor. I mean, he's got to be insane to think that. But then, a little the other day, I don't know if Dennis is here, but he told me this thing that really hit me. He said, if God is calling you to do something, that doesn't mean it's going to be easy. And that really made sense to me. So I was just doing this. And, and the entire time I've been going to church, I've been making it about myself. I mean, seriously, I'll go to church and I'll make it about me. I don't know if Kim Nordstrom is here, but man, I would make her so mad. All for myself. I would, man, I was so annoying. But I would make her so angry and it made me happy. And that's why I did it. And then, if, if any of you guys know me, I was the kid who peed on the bathroom floor of this building right here. This building right here, I peed on the bathroom floor. And if you guys know where Ronald was, he made me smell it. Uh, <laughs> man, I would go to the gym, I would scream at the top of my lungs. I didn't even pay attention to any of these people's sermons. I was just there for myself. Church was about me, not about God. But then that's when I come to the realization that we're not even put on earth for ourselves. We're literally put on earth to glorify God. And that's what changes everything. Because if you can put it to the perspective that you're not even on earth for yourself, it changes everything. And that's what really hit me. So ever since then, I've been growing with God. And now I'm getting baptized. And it's just insane to me. So that's that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so there was definitely a common denominator Nobody listens to sermons. <laughs> All right. All right. I'm going to ask you guys, so come up a little bit more this way so everybody can see what's happening. And we need to catch it on camera, too. Uh, I'm going to ask them a few questions um, before we baptize them. If you agree, say, I do. Uh, have you turned to Jesus Christ and accepted him as your Savior and Lord? Or, or you can say yes. Yeah. Yes. Have you put your whole trust in His grace and love? Yes. yes. Have you promised to follow and obey Him as your Lord? Yes. yes. Do you promise to support the church with your time, talent, and treasure? Yes. yes. Do you submit yourself to the leadership and discipline to the church and promise to promote His purity and peace? Based on their profession of faith, we're going to go ahead and baptize them now. start with uh, jo Jojo. Jojo, based on your profession of faith, we baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in the likeness of His death, raised to walk in newness of life. You can clap. <laughs> Joshua. Joshua, based on your profession of faith, we baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ and the likeness of His death and raised to walk in newness of life. Julia. Julio, based on your profession of faith, we baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in the likeness of His death, raised to walk in newness of life. Join me in prayer now. Father, we thank You for helping us witness today uh, new life. 
Thank you for showing us that you are still rescuing. You are still rescuing us out of darkness, changing our lives, redeeming lives, and bringing us into your kingdom by giving us new life. Lord, I pray for Jojo, I pray for Joshua, I pray for Julia. Continue to be with them, Lord. Walk with them. May they seek to know your love for them more. May they grow in their love for you each day more. May they be obsessed with you, Jesus. May you become their ultimate blessing. May they live this from this day forward for the rest of their lives for you and you alone. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
just uh, people baptized? Wait, why? So call the, the guys that got baptized? Yeah. Okay. And then, so they could take pictures with their families or if they want to take pictures. Okay. And we have like stuff for them. Okay. Also, before we end, uh, Matthew Chen right now is uh, Jojo, Julia, and Joshua's leader right now. He's, uh, he's discipling them. So he's going to come up and say a few words, and then we're going to do the benediction and go to lunch. Okay. Hello, my name is Matthew. I'm the youth leader at Grace Bible Church. Uh, I've been doing it for a pretty long time, about three weeks. Um, so yeah, pretty experienced, but I just think it's just so encouraging that by the second week of our Bible study, my entire youth ministry is already baptized. <laughs> so I think I can just retire now or something, right? But no, uh, all glory to God. And honestly, it's amazing to see uh, such young believers have so much passion, uh, so much desire to read the Word and just to uh, learn from it and just to grow in it. And I think that's something awesome to see, and I pray that uh, we as a church, and me especially as a leader, can just continue to minister to these young disciples and just help them to uh, grow in Christ and just uh, continue on the step of uh, faithfulness that they can just fulfill God's, uh, God's will in their lives. I pray that uh, God give us all the wisdom and the uh, power to do so. Uh, yeah, I'm just so excited to see what God has in store for these young believers' lives. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. You're doing a great job. All right, let's pray. Uh, GBC, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look with favor on you and give you peace. Amen.